Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Well, welcome to Getting to Know You. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're, we're talking to former Assemblyman Jack McEnany about, we're going to be talking about history. Now, he's retired from his political days. He was an eight-time um, Assemblyman. He's the Albany County historian for over 10 years. He's been involved in Albany politics, but today the topic is history. So welcome, Jack. Nice to have you. Well, thank you. Before we get going, I was going to mention you met, you've written a few books. Here's one called Albany. Um, Capital City on the Hudson. It's this. This one's from 1990. There was a, a newer edition. I was going to bring it up, but it was checked out. Um, your books go out. That's somewhere. always the acceptable reason I'm not having it. <laughs> I, yeah. I was actually I looking up. Some of these have gone out 60, 70 times. So luckily we have five or six copies. So um, and you're still involved with um, even though you're retired. A lot of your activities are involved in, in, of a history oh, yeah. nature. You're on the Capitol Commission for the Restoration, the um, State Archives Board. Yeah. You've been making a documentary on Channel 17 that just came out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So why don't we start with um, your interest in history? How did this lifelong interest uh, come about? <laughs> I, I like to think I was born with it, but I was raised in a what we call an extended family today. And, and uh, my grandmother lived with us, my mother's mother. And uh, sometimes somebody say, how come you do this or carry on this way? I said, because we, we were the last house on the street to get a television. <laughs> and you know, the lifestyle was that you would have uh, uh, my mother and her mother at home all the time, and neighbors would come in and visit. And without the television on yeah. or the distraction today, it'd be the computer. Uh, people just sat around the table and they talked. And at my age, I just turned 70 in August. And uh, uh, at, at my age, the, uh, the influence of television began to eat away at that conversation. But most of my contemporaries had parents who were World War II veterans. My father was a World War I veteran. Okay. And both my parents were in their 40s when they had me. And I think they had a totally different attitude than people who had gone through the Depression in World War II. Uh, they were more pragmatic. I had the doughboy and the flapper at okay. home. And uh, it was a very sociable, very warm, hospitable and, house. And you had to have a good story. And what part of Albany was this? Uh, North Pine Avenue. Oh, OK. And, uh, in Pine Hills. Uh, my the mother's family moved there. Oh, I think they built the, the first house there in uh, uh, about 1907. And my mother was raised there in a two family. She always wanted a one family. I was born in a, in a one family. And, okay. and then we left for a little while. My father got a job down in the Empire State Building. He was an insurance man. And everybody got homesick. And we came back. And eventually, we bought another one family. Okay. So I lived at 31 North Pine, from the, okay. all on the same block. Well, well history, um, history is storytelling, wouldn't you? It is storytelling. <laughs> it, was, it was an art. And, and uh, when you came in as a kid, if you wanted to be listened to, you, you had to have something to say. So. Well, I can remember. I'm, I'm 57, and I can mm -hmm. remember my grandparents on both sides, the same kind of thing. Yep. There, was, there was definitely more yep. sitting around talking and telling stories and, about whatever. And no matter who walked in, the cup of tea came out. Yeah. And uh, that meant sit down and tell us what's new. And, and uh, I think you just listen to people and you listen to their stories, and it's important. Mm -hmm. And I never met, as I grew up and I went out in the world, I never met anybody that couldn't teach me something that I didn't know, regardless of how uh, different their lot in life well, might have been a good from mine. Attitude to have now. How did you start your study of history? You went to Siena, and did, yeah. that, did your is that I, where you really started? I went local, VI grade school and CBA in Siena, and was guess what, a history major. I went to grad school at the College of Saint Rose and left to go in the Peace Corps, and uh, 
So I never did get the master's degree. I've got 33 credits, but you know, for masters, those are stale. Oh, yeah. So uh, uh, every now and then I say, maybe I'll go back and, and do something, but uh, there hasn't been time. I retired January 1st and I've been out constantly traveling and doing one thing or another, but so maybe are, someday. Are you one of those retirees who's, who are always saying, I'm busier now than when I was? Yes, <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You're busier doing more of the things you want to do. That's true. That's I, true. I spent 20 years, actually it was 10 terms, oh, ten? Okay. In, in the uh, legislature. And in the legislature, there's only two speeds, too fast and too slow. Okay. And it's just agony when you're into the, the too slow, you're in session, don't go back to your office and use your phone and have your notes, wait, we're going to have a bill in a little while, and an hour and a half later, a bill comes out. Right. And uh, there's a lot of talking <laughs> and so on, a lot of downtime. Yeah. And uh, there's no downtime now. Now, before you were an assemblyman, you were the Albany County historian. Could you talk a little bit about what that job entailed and how you went about it? And, uh... Well, I worked under uh, uh, Jim Coyne, and I was the historian for the nearly four years that I was in the county. I was also the deputy um, assistant was oh, okay. the title then, county, uh, so the historian county executive. So the historian wasn't was, a full-time? It was part-time, oh, okay. and, and sadly, the county of Albany has not... Uh, appointed a, uh, an historian or in so. violation of state law, but we haven't had one for a number of years okay. now. And uh, I wish they'd do it. Yeah. I know they've been looking at some people to take it. So what, what does yeah. the job of the, when you were doing it, what did that job entail and how did you? Uh... It, it's whatever you make of it. Uh, for historians, I, I tried to get a bill through. I did get it through in the assembly, but not in the Senate to get certified county historians, which okay. would be a voluntary program. But you coordinate with other historians more as an equal, that you're not mm -hmm. uh, above them in any way. And there's a constant stream of uh, inquiry that goes on all the time. I gave many speeches, obviously, but I've always done that. But people would uh, want direction. Where do I go to get this and that? A lot of genealogical material. And uh, one of the great joys is every time they would find a skeleton under the street, uh, I'd have to go there and explain this yeah. used to be a cemetery and okay. the street used to be narrower and so on and so forth. So. Um, Many times you'd be brought in to solve mysteries. Okay. And of course, that's the that's the fun genealogy in local history. It's the poor man's treasure hunt. There's, now, well, there's always a treasure out there. Well, somewhere. in the public library world, that's a big thing. People coming in for genealogy a lot. Oh yeah. Now, when you were the Albany County historian. Um, what kind of, um, I've never been down, what kind of archives do they have? Or? They have very good archives, and, and they started, uh, I used to run the, the CETA program for Mayor Corning, okay. and there was a fire in the attic of City Hall. We had a city records library, and uh, Guy Paquin was the county clerk at the time, and Bob Arnold, uh, who worked for me at the time and eventually wound up working for the state of New York, coordinating county historians mm -hmm. and specifically the uh, local records and archives uh, programs. We decided we needed a hall of records and the county uh, went in with the city. It's primarily a county facility overwhelmingly for a record center, disposal of things that should be disposed and saving of things that uh, that should be saved. And for, the, for the public to come in and... Yeah, the, the Hall of Records is now down on Tivoli Street. Okay, and yeah. that was created after that fire. Oh, okay. And a lot of materials were gathered, they were saved, they were restored. There's constant research that goes mm -hmm. there. It's very consumer friendly. And I'm sure many of your patrons here at the Colony oh, sure. Library are very familiar with the Hall well, of Records. Well, you say Tivoli Street. I, I've seen that yeah. address on a lot of... Well, people like to, um, what do you think? So many things are online now. I don't know if you've seen the genealogy online yeah, and stuff. Yeah, uh, um, so many are. For example, they took the naturalization uh, records. Mm -hmm. What most people would like more so than naturalization is the declaration of intention. Because the declaration of intention in the 19th century was what immigrants called first papers. You'd, you'd go and you'd say, I'm here, I intend to stay, okay. and I want to become a citizen. Five years later, sometimes the law would change that we yeah. need to be sooner, and if you joined the army, it'd be a lot sooner in the Civil War. <laughs> but then after a period of time, two sponsors would come in, say you were a worthwhile 
person and a, you, you were going to be a so, good American. But the first papers are not online. The declarations was an actual Yeah, but, um, but for gene genealogists, okay. they'll That's, put down where they're from. So not, as, just, not just Germany, they'll say where yeah. in Germany, not just Ireland. If you're lucky, it'll say the county in Ireland, sometimes the townland or the parish. So the first papers are much more specific for the origin, okay. the age a person comes over, and so on, then five years later when everybody knows they're not going to. All right, so it sounds yeah. like. They're you know, not online It yet. sounds like you're more of an old school. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of the. Well, um, they're not online yet. Well, they, yeah. so what do you think of um, online versus, you know, what you used to deal with before everything online? Is there, it's, are uh, they both, are there, is there, are, are they both I, this as well, or are they? Well, just, I can remember reading the 1855 census. I had a job that got out at four in the 60s, and I would run like the Dickens up to the old library, and they'd have the 55 census, and I read it page by page. It took me a couple of weeks to do it. Uh, it was a great experience. You mean the Albany area? So. Yes, it was, it was the big Albany County census, enormous. I read the entire city of Albany, and it took me weeks uh, to do it. Now, today, you can go to a census on an ancestry.com. Yeah. Oh, you don't even have to. You just, you just put in the name, it's indexed, <laughs> and there it is. But it's very, very important, depending on how important the material is, that you have some way to check it out. I'll give, give you an example. Uh, there's a wonderful collection online of all of the gravestones in Saratoga County. And there's one so-and-so daughter of went up and looked at the stone, it's wife of. Oh, okay. So there's something is lost yeah. in the transcription, and if you accept it as the gospel, you can really mislead yourself. There's a different kind of uh, online where things are actually photographed. And in Albany Rural Cemetery, which has over 100,000 uh, little index cards, yeah. the entire card is there for you to read. Okay. So you don't worry about a transcriber making, making a mistake. It, okay. You're looking at the original record just as much as if you went up in Menands to Albany Rural right. Cemetery. But what, I just, I'm fascinated that you read the census. What, what sort of, um, what did you learn from that? Other than where everyone lived? I mean, there must have been all kinds of. Oh, I learned things in, uh, of course, now you can, now they're scanned, yeah. you know, and you but can, still, you can yeah. see, but you get a better pattern, I think, okay. uh, looking at the original, and you can see the, some records are beautifully done. The 1855 New York State Census is beautifully done. The handwriting yeah. is, is very, very careful. It's the, um, also the only one that asked people at that time, how long have you lived in the county? Okay. So you can determine uh, the arrival of an immigrant, for example. But in 1865, that census is the sloppiest writing I ever saw. Okay. And I get the feeling that there was heavy patronage what, you were in the Union Army, you've got a okay, job. Okay. And the spelling, <laughs> the lack of capitalization is just a far cry from what have, okay. would have happened before the war. All right, so that, that is interesting seeing that. They part. vary. They vary in quality. Well, um, what aspects of Albany's history, now sometimes I think we forget Albany's been around since, what, 1686, right? I mean... No, no, that's just... Well, that's, that, the, that's, that's the charter. Okay. <laughs> that's the charter. No, we're, I know it goes back, but... Yeah. Are there certain aspects or periods of Albany's history that you've, you you particularly are enthusiastic about, or you like studying, or I whole? like uh, uh, I, I enjoy 19th century when the the country is is forming, when the population seems to be uh, uh, doubling in the early yeah. years, and and. Uh, uh, my original field of history, I was a Fort William Henry guide up at, uh, okay. uh, up at Lake George for four summers while I went to Siena. My original area was the French and Indian War, okay. and I've never lost an interest in that. 19th century, the layers of immigrants and the change and the social changes, the development of the city moving out into the rural areas, uh, I always find that fascinating okay. technology. If, if you study Troy, for example, that's their, their specialty, you know, where, where um, the spark of water is the spark of the yeah. revolution, you know, somewhat of a self-contradictory term, but that's the Industrial Revolution, 
and uh, how the world changed overnight for those people. The whole industrial revolution, it, it, it gave the, it attracted people from all over the globe. Those people would move up, the next group would right. come in, and uh, well, I've, I've enjoyed that. When I'm, I'm from yeah. Troy, and I, whenever I've read or seen pictures, particularly say along River Street, you know, where Clue is, there's yeah. massive factories and yeah. uh, whatever, all kinds of, it was, it was a very, um, the population was like very big. I mean, oh, it was a major competitor to uh, Albany in a lot of different ways. Oh, okay. It was very New England Yankee. Uh, we had a foundation that was Dutch and then New England Yankee. Um, a lot of the um, sectarian uh, stress between, say, the Irish and the uh, and the old Protestant establishment. It's very negative in Troy. It's nothing li near like that in, in Albany, where you have Erastus Corning, a, a Connecticut Yankee. This is the first yeah. Erastus, yeah. you know, giving speeches for uh, home rule and uh, uh, tenants' rights and and. Uh, in Ireland, these, in all these progressive causes, pro-immigrant, etc., you don't have that in Troy. Yeah. And Troy has draft riots in the Civil okay. War. Albany does not. Yeah. There's, a, there's a difference in the two communities, well, and all the industrial giants are competing with one yeah. another. Okay. Now, all this studying and learning about history, when you finally became an assemblyman, did you find that knowing, studying, yes. being involved in history, did that really, did that help? It was or? a tremendous help. Uh, I think knowing the past, and knowing what's worked, what hasn't, uh, being able to see things about to happen because they happened before, and maybe head them off if they're negative or bring them forward if they're not. Uh, it's a type of, of knowledge that's only useful and it, it's very helpful. It's also important to communicate with people. And because I had the history background and I could talk about a people who came that was, would be their grandparents or great grandparents, or how a neighborhood developed. And don't forget, I had the all four hill towns up That's in the right. mountains, as well as uh, as Gilderland in New Scotland. So I had urban, suburban, and rural. And it was a great communications tool yeah, well, to could. get out to their libraries and give a talk. And then after every talk, on a historical point of view, somebody would say, "You know what? You should have mentioned or, okay. or something." But from a political point of view, people were comfortable. They were on their turf. Yeah. And they might not be of your political persuasion or anything, but they would go into that type of, of uh, dialogue or lecture. And then they'd come up after and they'd talk okay. about something wasn't working in the state or the county or something. So it was a very good communication Did tool. Did you ever uh, mention, I know where your ancestors <laughs> lived in 1855? From oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I've, I've done that a lot. The only thing is, I remember I went to, to one fellow up in the hill towns once, and he was, oh, and we've been here so many years, and so on and so forth. And this little voice is saying, keep your mouth shut, because I knew when his great-great-grandfather was hanged <laughs> <laughs> for being a Tory, and I thought, eh, I, I think I'll keep that one to myself and not go, if he's not volunteering, I'm not. Well, do you think... You you just said it was helpful for a legislator to sort of know about history. I don't know what, when you were in the assembly, how much history knowledge your colleagues had, but do you think people involved in, in legislating should, should know more about history, or would it help, or do you it's, think they do know? Or it just uh, There's a lot of lip service yeah. uh, given to it, not necessarily a lot of support, but it's a wonderful communication tool, and you can use it for illustrations of what happened before, and you know, I'm, I have to give a talk uh, to the Bar Association for one of their continuing ed groups. I'm the after dinner speaker this week up in Vermont. Okay. They go on a retreat, and, mm -hmm. and I think they concentrate this group on environmental law and what's new and different on it. And the topic will be the impeachment and the removal from office in October of 100 years ago in, uh, in 1913 of uh, Governor William Sulzer, and the parallels between Sulzer and Spitzer, whom I served under, yeah. are very, very common. All right, so he was involved yeah. in a scandal. And very much in common. Well, it was involved, but also his attitude toward some of the people that put him there in mm -hmm. the first place, the holier-than-thou attitude and so on. It, uh, there was a lot of parallels in yeah, human okay. nature. and. Uh, 
you see that again and again. Well, they always say um, history history repeats itself. It repeats itself. <laughs> it does. The human nature has constants that uh, cross the generations and the centuries. Well, now um, one other thing you were telling me before we started in your retirement here, you're involved in several um, boards and commissions. Could you, why don't you just tell us which ones you're on and what, some of the work well, you're well, doing? Well, this month we have our, our big lecture of James McPherson is coming for the State Archives. The, um, the Civil War historian? The Civil War right. historian. Yes, and that, very, that's very famous writer. And, yeah. and that's one of our most successful events, and it brings uh, money in. It's a modest cost to go to it. It's down in the egg, but it brings money into the, when is he gonna be to the archives. November 7th. November 7th. And this yeah. is the um, yeah. the New York State Archives? Yeah, New York State Archives Partnership Trust. Which and you're is, on, you, you're in I've been on it for oh, years. Okay. Yeah. So that's. Uh, I'm uh, the honorary chair of a program at St. Agnes Cemetery here in Menands. Okay. And uh, it's for to replace veterans' tombstones or put them there if they were never there before. Okay. And by coincidence, my son Daniel put uh, St. Agnes Cemetery on the National Register of Historic Sites, first and only Catholic cemetery to get that status. Really? Uh, and a tombstone, a replacement white marble mm -hmm. tombstones, which are now in Civil War style. Okay. They weren't originally. Uh, cost $250 unless your cemetery is on the National oh, Register. Okay. Then they're free from oh, the okay. Defense Department. So we've put up uh, the... Uh, uh, cemetery has put up at this point I think something like a hundred plus or a hundred and fifty well, tombstones Agnes, of well, veterans in St. Agnes Cemetery. But of all wars or just the Civil War? Well this, we're talking just the Civil okay. War eventually uh, but bear in mind they're the most at risk. Yes, okay. You know when we use marble and brownstone uh, and, uh, and limestone we put wonderful things on tombstones the place of birth was put there, the uh, son or daughter of so-and-so, mother or, bro or, or father of so-and-so, poetry, service records, mm -hmm. all kinds of things plus art. That was the good side. The bad side was after 150 right. years with acid rain and wind and all kinds of things, you can't make it out and it's, okay. it's being lost every day. Granite was wonderful. The thing is, that's when people started putting just the year of birth, okay. skipping they, they, the birthday, the month they were born and died, and so on and so, so forth. So it lasted longer, but there was less information. Uh, much less that's information. Kind of so, you know, it's one of the major activities of historical groups, almost always done by volunteers, is to try and transcribe these old tombstones because they're not going to be there okay. forever. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned earlier you're on the Capitol Commission for the Restoration. Yes. Or uh, the Restoration yeah. of the Capitol. What is that? Our, our big big thing there is uh, uh, hopefully by this Christmas you'll see a new Capitol Story book. There was a, um, a book called Capitol Story that mm -hmm. was out years ago. Whenever you find one, they're falling apart. And uh, we've, we've learned a great deal more over the years with the Commission for the Restoration of the Capitol. Under uh, Governor Pataki, a lot of work was done on the restoration of the roof. Under Governor Cuomo, the inside has been turned into a living museum. And what's been done just in the last few years is extraordinary, plus that long-term uh, restoration not only of the roof, but of the skylights that let in okay. uh, get... they. they undo a lot of the harm that was done okay. to the Capitol. I think you were, people may have seen yeah. it on Channel 17. It was a documentary. You that that was in. the third one, yeah. Okay. I, I narrated that one, and that was letting in the light. But there's been a previous one on the, the stone carving. There's, a previous, there's one in between on just the restoration mm -hmm. of the roof, which okay. was an extraordinary feat. That, the Capitol was, is like a cathedral. It's not built over years. It's built over generations. And it's a gift that one generation gives to generations yet unborn. A lot of the people that worked on the Capitol never saw it finished. And to some minor extent, it's still not finished in some areas. Well, when it was originally built, it, it was several decades, right? I mean, yes, if, well, <laughs> it depends on who you talk yeah. to. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, they started the work in uh, 1869. And in uh, 1899, 
Teddy Roosevelt came in. There were cost <laughs> overruns. It wasn't done, and people were talking about the next step. And the tower they were going to build, they started to build it, then they brought it down. Now they'll never build it. And Teddy Roosevelt, not known for his patience, Let's issued see. a proclamation, may have even been number one, <laughs> that the New York State Capitol in Albany is complete. It wasn't, but it was a great proclamation, and there was still work that had to go on. Uh, but uh, officially, it's 30 years. So officially, just, it's about $25 million when people were lucky to be making $9 a week yeah. and being middle class to do that, it. That sounds like something he would do. He was quite... <laughs> Yeah, Roosevelt solve that problem. <laughs> well, what what would you say for you know, anyone watching? And obviously, you you will you Jack is always speaking. You were just telling me this is October since you retired in January. You've you've already spoken seventy or eighty times. Sure, counting short ones and and after dinner speeches. I did the two hundredth anniversary of the Albany Academies to kick okay. off theirs and for uh, for the boys side of it. And, so you. And, uh, the 250th of the pre first Presbyterian Church, it, a lot of, a lot of things like that came. Okay. So, so you may you may yeah. see you may see him out speaking somewhere. But so, what would you say to people um, with you know with your lifelong experience? Because this question always comes up: wh Why why study history? I mean, I realize well, it's fascinating. Uh, it's 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 humanity. We're all a part of humanity. There's lessons to be learned. There's uh, treasures to be found. I particularly like local history. Local history is that history which is closest to us and to our community. And it's a history that was once so commonly known that nobody felt the need to record it. If it was in the newspapers, it got filed away. So you're not discovering as much as you're rediscovering okay. something that was commonly known. And then also, as some of the uh, prohibitions of society, uh, mixed marriages of people of different races, for example, things like that used to be deep, dark secrets. And as society moves forward, there's no need for that yeah. anymore. You have to understand where they were at that time. Mm -hmm. So there are some incredible discoveries that are always being made of I didn't know that, mm -hmm. and that explains why this was kept quiet, or one thing or another like that. Well, there's always books coming out on a subject you think would be <clears throat> exhausted, like for example, the American uh, Civil War. Yes. Uh, every You would think, what else could we know about oh, the, it? But there's always, and not they, only new books, but new information. Well, they were letter writers, too. Yeah. And well, there are these wonderful uh, collections of private letters that are always being discovered, and they shed new light on uh, old knowledge that we thought was yeah. complete. I don't know if in the future they're going to be studying emails. I'm not sure. Well, you know, <laughs> I worry about that. I, I worry about that. I, I went uh, uh, over to the Spectrum, and they had a fundraiser for the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, Solomon Northrop's story, which is uh, 12 years a oh, slave. Yeah, yeah. A brutal movie. movie to watch because it's very realistic. And in real life, you don't fade to black. Well, he wrote his own... He wrote it. Yeah, he was captured. He was uh, Saratoga-based, and he was a musician. He was a violinist, and he was lured down to New York for a uh, position where his wife was working at a hotel anyway for a, a two or three weeks. So he went down there and has come down to Washington. And when he went down to Washington, he had his manumission papers. Actually, I think he was born free, but it said he was a free man and could travel. And his, he woke up in chains, and his manumission papers were gone, and he was sold south down to Louisiana to, in a slave market in brutal, brutal conditions. And that's what the movie's about. He finally came back, and when he did, he wrote uh, his narrative, mm -hmm. 12 years a uh, slave and then a long subtitle after that, and became uh, quite a celebrity going around to abolition meetings all over the, uh, all over the North uh, explaining what the realities of slavery were. So he was quite a celebrity when he came back, but he paid a terrible price. Well, in, those um, uh, in American yeah. history, those slave narratives, there's, there's probably a dozen that are very famous. They're, they're very amazing yeah. to read. They're very but sad. You, but, you know, there's not as many as you would think. And there's not as many. Uh, we all know in our own generation the World War II veteran mm -hmm. who never talked about what he did. 
I'm always uh, reminded, you know, Dad, he never told us he was in That's Normandy. That's very common. Uh, very yeah. common. And then they hit 70 or so, and suddenly the stories start coming out. Yeah. In, the, in the Irish famine, which wiped out over a million people from disease and, and uh, famine, uh, outright starvation, and 75 years later, the Irish government went to interview the children of um, people who had survived the famine or died in the famine for that matter. And they went all through the country. This is 1925. Okay. They had people who spoke Irish to the old people and so on. Only 2,500 people would even cooperate with it. Really? And the reason was that it had shrunk this island down to a third of its population mm -hmm. by 1900. Two million people plus had emigrated. Country never recovered, and to some areas still hasn't recovered. It was so painful that no one would talk about it. For the 150th anniversary, we've got more books on the famine, all coming out yeah. within a decade because you needed distance. Same thing with the Holocaust. The Holocaust was not talked about instantly. I mean, well, I think the word didn't even come into use until the 60s or 70s. That's right. I mean, it's a that's common right. word with a and then, letter. And then when the survivors or their children realize the knowledge is going to be lost, then mm -hmm. it's more comfortable to talk about it okay. then. But survivor's guilt uh, in very painful things and just the outright pain, the closer you are to the event, you, the less likely you are to talk about it. Okay. And, well, and uh, as we, we go on in generations, that's why we often find out things 100, 150 years after the fact. Yeah. And suddenly our eyes open yeah. up and say, that's what went on. Well, it sounds like you're not just a, a historian of the Capital District in Albany. So. Oh, no. So why don't we end with this? Um, historians talk and study about the past. Would, and you know, 2013, what would, you, would you have anything to say um, from looking at the past your whole life? What, do you, what would you have to say about Albany's uh, future? I think it's good. I think it's still as, as fascinating as ever because these are all history. The main word is story. Mm -hmm. And the stories are there and there's human beings creating new stories all the time. And it's the job of the historian to record them. I remember being taught in school that you couldn't write history for 20 years because that was all current events. <laughs> and we know the people that we've uh, thought of as villains or heroes. Mm -hmm. 20, 25 years later, we take a look at them. We watch with presidential oh, standards. Presidents are always reassessed. They're, they're always going yeah. up and down. Yeah. Right. And of course, the other thing is you can't judge the past with our eyes. Mm -hmm. You have to think of it in their eyes, the world they're born into. Yeah, okay, well. Thank you so much for our enlightening talk here. You may see Jack speaking anywhere, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> and um, we, have his, we have his book here in the library, several copies, yep. all editions, Albany, the capital city on the yeah. Hudson. The new one has a wonderful Len Tantillo. Okay, yes, the new one has That's a different. That's not the new one. <laughs> this is an old, the new, I was going to say, the new one's checked out. It, yeah. These books go out a lot. So thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on Getting to Know You.